All right, folks. Um, now move to question time. And uh, this question is for the Minister for Infrastructure. Number 11 has been withdrawn. I call Jerry Carl. Uh, this is an operational decision taken by TransLink. However, my department have taken time to request the information from TransLink. TransLink have advised that the 10J and 10K services were extended from Glen Collins some years ago in order to have a through service from Twinbrook and to replace the original 10E feeder service. They recently acknowledged that this model did not work, hence the return to the previous version of the 10J and 10K with the reinstatement of the 10E service throughout the week. Mr. Carl. Thank you, Minister. Minister, this is not the first time a transport change has been made in West Belfast without people impacted being consulted or notified. There used to be four early bus services going up to Suffolk Road. There are now two. Minister, there was reportedly a heated meeting between unions and TransLink about the specific decision about 10J and 10K. Are you aware of that meeting? And if not, can you investigate and report back on that issue? Thank you. Sir, I, I'm not aware of the meeting. I, I'm happy to uh, inquire of TransLink in that regard. But as I said, during my opening remarks. This is an operational decision by TransLink. Um, the legislation st sets out what's TransLink's role, what's my role. Um, and I, I, while I'm happy to follow up on the member's request, um, you'll also understand it's not my responsibility to day-to-day -day manage everything that goes on within TransLink. Their, their relationships, and I would expect them to have good working relationships with the unions, uh, is an, excuse me, an ongoing matter between them and the unions. John Blair. And with your permission, if I may extend the interest in the uh, Belfast bus route slightly towards the South Andrew boundary, but stem within the city, can I ask the Minister if he can give us any further information or updates on the anticipated north south glider route and the introduction of that? Minister. It is very difficult for a member, the member will understand, for a Minister to prepare for question time to start discussing every bus route and translink route <laughs> across the country. Um, it really is. I am not sure it benefits question time uh, as well. Um, I'm, I'm more than happy. To, I'm more than happy to. Well, I'm sure there's several thousand TransLink bus routes. I, I'm, I can stand here all day and read out the responses to them, but I'm not sure how much I attest the patience of the speaker. So, uh, but I'm more than happy to get the information the members requested and forward it on to them. Normally, myself does the rebuking, Mr. O'Dowd, but I'll allow you away with it this time because you were right. Um, Sinead Annis. Question two. Sure. Um, I recognise the infin inconvenience caused by the temporary closure of one lane on both of the Shore Road Rostrava and the Keel, Keel Road Hilltown due to landslips caused by the unprecedented weather in November 2023. My department has appointed a specialist geotechnical engineer to assist in design solutions. However, the scale and complexity of the work required at both locations means that it will take time to deliver the permanent and cost-effective solutions. Regarding the A2 Shore Road, a temporary design solution has been developed to allow two-way traffic, and we are currently awaiting environmental approvals from NIEA to allow the work to go ahead. Our contractor is ready to carry out the work as soon as approval comes through. The land slip on the Kilkee Road in Hilltown is likely to require a complex solution as the embankment uh, to either side has become unstable, and therefore this will take uh, additional time to be brought or to be thoroughly investigated. A design completed and then have this implemented. I can assure the member that my department will continue to prioritise this work to allow two way traffic uh, as soon as possible. Ms. Ennis. I thank the Minister for that response. And I know that he does understand the level of disruption that this has caused, particularly on the A2 Shore Road. Um, and just in respect to his answer, can, I, can the Minister give a guarantee that he is um, putting the necessary push, especially on the NIEA and the other departments that have responsibility here, to make sure that the A2 Shore Road is opened as soon as possible permanently to two way traffic? Thank you. Minister. I, I can assure the member, and the member has raised this issue with me on a number of occasions, and I think we are going to organise a visit to that site uh, at some stage in the future. But as I said, the initial land site was quickly, clear, quickly cleared, but there remained a risk from the embankment was unstable, uh, and as a result, my temporary measures were installed by my department. The land within this area is of outstanding natural beauty, with several environmental designations that restricts the work that can be undertaken. My department, DERA, Forest Service and EA 
Uh, the environmental agency officials have had regular engagement to progress this matter. Engi engineers are now content that a temporary solution can be put in place to allow a full recovery of the road. My department is currently awaiting environmental approval to proceed with this work. Um, well, Holland, I want to hear what you have to say about Trevor Hill Town. Well, I was going to say there's not that many landslides in Northern Ireland, so hopefully I won't be rebuked for talking about another landslide. But it was just, Minister, as you know, obviously I have an entire farming community um, cut off due to a landslide on the Glenchesk Road. We're now looking at nearly a year for that uh, community, so I'm just wondering if there's any updates that the department can provide. Sorry to Ross Trevor and Kilkeel, as much as they are of interest to me, I'll maybe focus on the landslide in North Antrim. Minister. Um, well, uh, since the speaker didn't rebuke you, then I, I, I will not dare to. Um, yes, the, the, this is a significant landslide in, 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 the, in the area that the member refers to, and it's again another one that really requires a significant engineering solution, if an engineering solution can be found to it, given the scale of the landslide there and the undermining of the roadworks in that area. So, yes, my, engine, my officials are continuing to work to see if we can identify a solution to that. But it does highlight, and, and both incidents came about as a result of torrential rainfall, and we have seen a significant change in our rainfall patterns and the intensity of those rainfalls, and it's a reminder of the impacts of climate change are having on our society. Robbie Butler. At number three, please, Mr Speaker. Minister. The proposed A1 Junctions Phase 2 scheme from Hillsborough to Lac Brickland has been developed to address the most prevalent safety measures, or sorry, the most prevalent safety measures uh, on the 25 kilometres of the dual carriageway, particularly focusing on the closure of all gaps in the central median, including the installation of a concrete safety barrier, uh, the provision of four great separated junctions, the closure of nine minor roads which connect with the A1, and the altering all remaining roads and accesses to operate on a left-in, left-out basis only. Preparation for the procurement process is now underway, involving the finalisation of the contract documents in readiness for a formal procurement competition. This process is due to commence next month and last between 12 to 15 months. Construction is planned to begin in February 2026 and continue to completion over the following three years. Mr Butler. <coughs> I thank the Minister for his, his answer and I hope the Minister will, will forgive me. I, I just want to pay tribute to two people who died on the road. One was a former fire service colleague and one a friend that I grew up with, so, and I know the Minister is wedded to the delivery. So the Minister has outlined the time frame for the completion of the project. Can the Minister then outline what the cost implications will be and if there are any budgetary pressures? And can we get a commitment that, that it will be delivered on time regardless of budget? Minister. <coughs> Um, well, uh, I'm not sure I can say regardless of the budget, because there is a procurement exercise going on, and we want to get best value for public purse. But the current cost estimates going forward for the scheme is around 110 million to 120 million pound. Um, that will come out of my, bod my department's budget. I have already made a commitment to move ahead with this scheme, and that commitment remains. Uh, John Buckley. Minister's update in relation to the A1, which also travels through our own constituency in Upper Ban and has had huge implications in terms of life and safety along that route. The wider issue surrounding Hillsborough has been long in the press as to the severe traffic congestion that it itself faces, particularly as a rat run for many large heavy goods vehicles. I know the Minister's department has in past looked at this issue. Is there any further update that the Minister can provide to the House? It, it, it has been raised with me on several occasions, and my, work, my department officials have carried out studies to see if there is a solution uh, to Royal Hillsborough. We have not found that solution as yet that, that would not cause significant traffic congestion and disruption on outlying roads. I am due to meet the, the member's party colleague, the Deputy First Minister, uh, in the coming weeks, and we will have further discussions about it. David Honeyford. To the Minister, thank you for outlining the sort of time frames of what we're doing. It's a vital upgrade of the A1, and as, as others have said, uh, the safety element here is, is, is paramount. But is there anything the Department can do in the short term um, to, to improve safety on the road right now? Minister. We will constantly keep under review any measures we can take to improve road safety, particularly along the A1, given its horrific uh, traffic accident history. Um, but as I've said to members before, the most effective way of improving road safety is road user behaviour. And um, we have to ensure that when we're using our roads that we act in a way which keeps ourselves and others safe along that road. 
Even done. Mr. I am pleased to confirm that the review of the part time 20 mile an hour speed at, at schools initiatives which saw the, uh, the facility introduced at 216 schools is complete. I have had the opportunity to consider the, re the review report and I am content. I do, however, want to share the report with the Infrastructure Committee before it is published and have asked officials to make the necessary arrangements. I do wish to explore how we introduce 20 mile an hour speed limits in general and have requested a paper from my officials in, this, in regards to this matter. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for the answer. And, and can the Minister uh, reiterate his commitment to improving road safety uh, within our schools and also just to provide a wee bit more in terms of time frame on when you think you can move forward? And will you commit to, to increasing the amount of 20 mile an hour uh, speed zones around our local schools? Minister. Uh, thank the member for, for that question. As I say, I, I do want to see. The, or have the committee give, been given the opportunity to review the report before I publish it. I expect that to happen in the next number of weeks. Uh, the report's findings have been positive, however, and it, it was good to see such feedback from teachers, pupils uh, and uh, parents in, in regards to the matter. It did raise a number of, of questions and perhaps even a number of challenges as to how you move forward to the introduction of it, but the detail I leave to another, to another time. Could the minister tell us if he has plans to roll out the school streets initiative? Graham Abbott. Minister. The, the school streets initiative, for, for, for members who are maybe not familiar with the scheme, would mean that in a designated street would be closed off to all tra uh, traffic at a certain time of the day, obviously uh, schools opening and closure times. Um, we are looking at it in part of a broader aspect of work we are involved in, particularly in terms of active travel on how we promote more active travel. And schools would be a good example of how, where and when we could have, um, promote active travel. So it is part of that formula moving forward in ter terms of discussions and consultations around it. Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And just following on, on that exact same theme, Mr Sheehan has raised to the School Streets Initiative. My constituency in South Belfast is one where there are umpteen examples of schools that would really benefit from at least testing the school streets model, which isn't just about safety, it's also about air quality and, as you say, active travel. So could we have a specific timeline as to when the Minister expects to be able to update us as to whether it will be tested, at least in pilot, or, or rolled out further across the north? Minister. Um, I, I hope to be able to launch our active delivery plan for consultation in November. Links to schools and other uh, attractors are priorities within that plan. Work in this area, is, area also includes consideration of measures that can be used in the vicinity of schools, such as we have discussed, to improve the environment for parents and young people, walking, wheeling <coughs> and cycle, cycling. Our officials are taking forward a number of pilot projects at present that will inform future direction in this area. Megan. Um, I was due to ask you a question about the school street scheme, but I think if your answer is not so far, if you'll indulge me, I will say there's a school in my constituency where a child has been involved in a road traffic collision walking to school um, with uh, the next rollout. Respectfully, it's question time, not step time for statements. So if you have a question, we'll move on. Alan Chambers. Thank you, uh, would the minister agree with me that inconsiderate and careless parking outside schools can provide as big a threat to the road safety of our children as vehicle speed? Yes, and, and schools struggle with this every day. I'm, I'm a parent myself, and uh, I, I know in terms of even going to my local primary school and so, some of the parking you see and behaviour you see, by a minority uh, is totally unacceptable, and it does present a danger to the children who are leaving and entering that school. And I would appeal to everyone to be considerate how they park in and around our schools and to slow down when passing our schools. Paul McGrath. <coughs> Minister. As Minister, we are responsible for promoting and improving road safety. I want to work actively with partners to reduce deaths and serious injuries on our roads. I believe the targeted provision of infrastructure at local schools can go a long way to making our roads and communities safer. I am aware of the ongoing issues at Edward Street down Patrick and in particular in the, in the immediate vicinity of Our Ladies and St Patrick's Primary School. My department has taken forward a study to establish what options are available to introduce engineering measures to improve road safety and traffic uh, progression along Abbey Street in Den Patrick. Due to the recent opening of a new Eurospar and the emerging, sorry, the emerging of three schools to form the Kiel Trinity Grammar School, we have now commissioned further traffic studies 
for inclusion or for further traffic surveys for inclusion in the study to inform other options. My officials will arrange with others, or shall I will arrange another meeting with DEA representatives, including the MLAs, after we receive the conclusions of the study to discuss a way forward. Uh, Mr. McGrath. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. During the collapse of these institutions, I had asked the Department for a resolution to the issues from the Minister has come back. I have asked him, I have written to him, I have spoken to him, and each and every time we're told that something is happening at some point in the future. What message would the Minister have to the primary school child who on the 18th of September was pinned up against the railings in fear as a vehicle had to mount the footpath in order to be able to maintain the traffic flow in the street? Mr. My message would be this. The driver of the vehicle should have been taking all precautions to protect the pedestrians on the footpath. There is no I have to mount the footpath. There is you drive at a speed which is appropriate to the area and you respect other road users. So in the member's question, he is targeting or pointing his, his question in the wrong direction. It's like Mr Chambers' question. You're driving past a primary school or any school. You drive appropriately to ensure that you're not presenting a danger to other road users. <coughs> Cathy Mason. Minister, for his answers, and uh, I do welcome that there are now further studies with the changes that have happened in the area. Um, you, you did mention about consulting with local representatives. Can I ask how and when that will happen? Minister. Uh, yes, when, when we have firm proposals to bring forward, and I understand the frustration of elected representatives in this regard, and even members of the public in this regard. But when you are going to change traffic going through a town or a village, it has implications for the roads and networks in and around that. So we have to rule out uh, taking actions which we may have damaging actions elsewhere in that road network. We want to make sure that when we take an action, it is the right action. But once we have an, or in a position, to ensure that we have a, a, a proposal, a workable proposal to bring forward, we will bring it forward in consultation with local councillors and MLAs and, and the MPs for the area. Good day. Uh, uh, thank the Minister for his responses so far. Um, can I ask the Minister um, for an assessment on how the active travel delivery plan, which he's already mentioned, will um, better support active travel on the way to school? Um, sc schools obviously are are a rich source of promoting active travel if we can provide the proper infrastructure and safe environment for our students or for pupils and parents to walk to and from school. Um, so th they will be a central part of it. As I said, I hope to launch that consultation in November and there will be uh, much discussion as to how we ensure, particularly in terms of if we can get our young people and encourage them to start walking to and from schools, then you're setting a pattern in life which will hopefully stay with them for the remainder of their life. So it will be a central part of our active travel strategy. And Dodge. Storm overflows are a critical part of any wastewater system and during periods of heavy rainfall are designed to allow diluted sewage to spill into water bodies in accordance with regulations set out by NEA. Spills will form overflows uh, are made up. Spills from storm overflows are made up of waste water from households and businesses that is heavily diluted by rainwater. The vast majority of what is spilled is made up of rainwater. However, NI Water estimates that approximately one to two percent of what is spilled is raw sewage. NI Water publishes information on both predicted and actual spill volumes on its website. From information provided by NI Water on predicted spills into Belfast Lock, this equates to 1 to 2 per cent approximately, and therefore is around 28,000 cubic metres per year. Dan Buzz. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, the, the NI Water <coughs> estimate that there is around 20 million tonnes of untreated sewage spilled into our waterways annually. And that includes around 10,000 septic tanks that are on the inner boundary of Loch Ness. Would the minister agree with me that the issues around Loch Ness 
are not just an issue for the farming community, uh, who are easy to blame in this issue, but a wider issue that must be tackled in the round and a multifaceted issue. And will he commit to funding the devices that are necessary to allow us to ascertain just how much raw sewage is in our waterways? Minister. Thank you. Thank the member. Um, I agree it is a multifaceted issue in relation to Loch Ness. And finger pointing and blaming isn't going to get us anywhere. What we have to do is identify the issues and find uh, resolutions to those issues. In regards to my responsibilities and my responsibility as the sponsoring department for MI Water, I am working with my executive colleagues and others about ensuring that we have the proper funding for MI Water to put in place the wastewater treatment works, also to put in place the, the, the spillage monitors so we know exactly what, what's happening and where, where it's occurring and to, to work with others to ensure that we restore Loch Ney to its full health and well-being. Ask on the back of that why storm overflows um, can't be removed, or what would the implications be? Minister, to remove storm overflows completely would cost billions upon billions of pounds, and maybe not be the best, most effective usage of public monies in that context. There is no question we have to upgrade and install new wastewater treatment works. But uh, the most efficient wastewater treatment works will always have an overflow built into them. Because when a deluge of a storm comes, the, the system becomes overpowered, and you have to release the water somewhere. If you don't release the water, then it goes back up the system into schools and homes and properties. As I said in my original answer, while the volumes of water being released are quite significant. It usually contains between 1 and 2 per cent of raw sewage, which is not ideal. I'm not suggesting it's ideal, but it's 1 to 2 per cent of raw sewage being released into water courses, which themselves are being also heavily uh, influenced by the storm. So they're going into being further diluted. But every system, no matter how modern, how well invest, invested in it, will have an overspill facility built into it. Peter McGrandles. Thank you, Minister. To improve our water quality, Northern Ireland Water will have to maintain its wastewater treatment sites to an acceptable and high standard. And to do this, it will need to be able to spend above its RDL and CDL allocations. Has the Minister explored how he, they may be able to do this? I have. It's, it's a constant course of engagement I, I have and discussion. Um, I'm currently, as I've said, to answer one of the previous questions, was I'm engaging with my executive colleagues to see if we can. Uh, have more finances, financial capability in this financial year. I am looking at legislation in terms of the SUDS Build Sustainable Drainage, where we are trying to hold back some of the rainwater going into the system and let it release into the system slower, which means that it does not become overpowered as quickly as it can in some circumstances. I am also looking at in terms of developer um, contributions. That may require legislative change, and I am exploring that to see if that's part of the suite of solutions we, we require in relation to a sustainable funding model for MI Water moving forward. Dr. Reagan. I thank the Minister for his remarks so far. Minister, in a previous question, you alluded to the extreme weather events, which seem to be happening now with monotonous regularity. Uh, could the Minister say, is there any plans to improve the modelling that we're doing with the Met Office about these extreme weather events, particularly as the implications that they have for overpowering our sewage system and other areas of our infrastructure? Well, I, I, in, in terms of, of, of the spillage monitors, which uh, Ms Dodds referred to earlier on, that, that will give us an evidential basis of where the current areas are under the most pressure in terms of overflows and spillages. I also hope to be able to invest in a storm forecast or a floods forecasting centre for here, which I think would be hugely beneficial. It, it, it is quite a significant investment, but I think in terms of our forward planning work programme, it is something that we are going to have to invest in to ensure that we, are, we have a suite of, uh, of knowledge in front of us which allows us to plan, predict and react in a way which protects uh, homes and businesses moving forward. Ms. Question number seven, please. The review of the South East flooding contains 22 recommendations and these cover a range of measures including the provision of flood forecasting 
the development of additional flood risk management infrastructure and further improving communications and resilience. My department is currently progressing a study to assess the viability of further flood alleviation measures to reduce flood risk in Newry. The project team are also currently engaging with Newry, Mourn and Down Council with a view to potentially accelerating a section of the proposed flood alleviation works through the Council's theatre and conference facility suite. My department is also continuing to work closely with Newry Business Community to establish a regional community resilience group for them and others to improve preparedness for any future flooding. To alleviate the impacts of floods from rivers, my department will also continue to its inspection and maintenance regime in relation to designated watercourses and their associated infrastructure within the Newry and South Armagh catchments. An extensive programme of desilting works is also scheduled to be delivered this financial year in Newry for designated underground culvert infrastructure. Ms Kimmins. Thank the Minister for his answer so far, particularly as we come towards the first anniversary of the flooding last year, which decimated um, particularly Newry City and parts of South Armagh. With that said, can the Minister give me some more information then on the Regional Community Resilience Group, please? Thank you. Um, the Regional Resilience Group uh, has been set up in discussions with other agencies to see how we can work with uh, other agencies and communities to assist communities in, in their response to flooding and how they, they, they can assist when, when, when flooding incidents happen, particularly in the distribution of sandbags, etc., and storing sandbags in certain localities so they're easily accessible. Because, as the member knows and everyone knows, we don't always get significant warning as to when a flooding event is going to take place, or it's very difficult to predict where the exact major flooding incident is going to take place. So, working with local communities and local businesses, we want to be in a position to ensure that there's accessibility to some of the materials that we require for that first initial resp emergency response, working in conjunction with all the partners who respond to flooding incidents. Justin McNulty. Minister, as a result of flood events and flood risk and inadequate mitigation measures, um, households and businesses in Urien Armagh and South Armagh are being crippled by the cost of extortionate insurance premiums. What specific actions a bar cutting down ancient Irish oak trees, does your department propose to take to address flood risk factors in a manner that will ease the burden of crippling insurance costs for my constituents? The reality is, and, and the member throws a flippant remark, and if I had followed the member's advice and, and not carried out the necessary repairs or works in Uri, the flooding in Uri last year would have been worse than it was if I had followed your advice and your campaign. Uh, to do nothing, because you didn't come forward with an alternative solution. You, you know, you, you think you can run a government department through headlines. Yes, through the you chair, can't. Mr. Minister. You have to be able to run a government department through evidence-based interventions. My department had an evidence-based intervention for Newry. We carried it out, and as a result of carrying it out, we protected thousands of homes and thousands of businesses in Newry. Now, is more need to be done? Of course it needs to be done. And some of those decisions will be difficult. Some of them will be unpalatable. Some of them will require a minister to make an evidence-based intervention. And I will continue to do that. Philip Rett. <coughs> minister. Major road schemes are an important part of the work that is delivered by the department as we seek to reduce journey times, increase reliability and improve road safety. In October 2022, I published a placemaker and active travel review report on the scheme and asked my officials to carry out further work on three scenarios were recommended within it. The work to repair a placemaking and active travel development report has now been completed. Due to the underinvestment in major road schemes and the constrained budget position, the scheme was considered as part of the prioritisation of major schemes and further work on the scheme was paused as part of the outworkings of that review. I plan to meet with officials in the coming weeks to review the, uh, the scheme and which will allow me to consider the way forward for the entirety both of the major roadworks development and the placemaking scheme. Any subsequent decisions to proceed with the York Street interchange project can only be made when I am confident there is budget certainty for the scheme Honest delivery in line with my department's emerging transport plans. Mr. Rep. 
Speaker, <coughs> and the Minister will be aware of the traffic chaos that took place in our city centre um, at the weekend and the need for major roadworks to take place. But given the budget constraints he's outlined, will he this department then commit to delivering smaller scale projects such as the pedestrianisation of Hill Street in my constituency, which has also been paused, uh, which would have little financial requirement for his department but would have a big impact Minister, in our capital city? Minister, very briefly, please. The, the traffic chaos you refer to at the weekend is a result of a three point two million pound road improvement scheme being carried out in Belfast. I suspect people in rural Fermanagh and rural Tyrone and elsewhere are going aghast that people are complaining that they're getting three two point two million pounds spent in their area. <laughs> Move to topical questions. Nicole Mark Durgan. Mr Speaker, could the Minister uh, outline what action he is taking to improve the electric vehicle charging network? The electric vehicle charging network is, an, is a commercial operation being driven by commercial entities, which has seen significant success in recent times. And we are seeing more and more electric vehicle charging points being made available to members of the public on that commercial basis. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It seems that this is one, another one of these ones. It's a commercial operation until there's something positive to announce, but when there isn't, it's back to being a commercial one. Given uh, that the Minister's stated commitment to electric vehicle improvements, could he explain why 25 months after he announced £1.3 million funding from the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles for on-street residential charge point schemes, the tender for this project has not yet been released? Mr. Um, I, I don't have the full details of the scheme in front of me. It's perhaps the scheme the member is referring to in terms of working in conjunction with local councils. Sorry, please catch the member's eye. Uh, working in conjunction with local councils uh, moving forward. I, I'm more than happy to follow it up for the member. But as I say, um, this is going to be a commercially driven operation moving forward. The Department of Infrastructure, for instance, doesn't provide access to petrol stations or diesel stations. We, we, that's, that's not part of our function or moving forward. Is our role. It might well be nice if you had the financial backing to be able to nationalise the electrical vehicle charging network. I could be very tempted to go down that road. I simply don't have the financial role <laughs> to do it at this time. Jonathan Buckley. Karen, I know the Minister is in fine form today. Um, so on that point, I don't know if he listens to Cool FM, but if he did this morning, he would have heard the pleas regarding traffic congestion in Belfast city centre. And it's not just road uh, works, but serious issues pertaining to congestion. So can I ask the Minister to explain in detail what his department's plans are to alleviate the serious congestion concerns, not just in Belfast, but across Northern Ireland? There are serious, I agree with the member, there are serious traffic congestion in Belfast in the mornings and during the evening in Rushire. Um, part of it is as a result of a £340 million investment at a new uh, Grand Central Station, and part of it is as a result of the £3.2 million pound that is being spent on upgrading the Sydenham Bypass. So the reason why some of it is happening is because we are making an investment in our infrastructure for the economic well-being of us all. Um, I have asked my officials to monitor the Belfast situation closely to see if there is interim measures we can take while the, the, the work in around Grand, Balf Bal Grand, Grand Balfour Central Station is going ahead to see if there's changes to lighting operations or street lighting operations that we can take, which would help alleviate uh, the traffic in around that. I accept that there's always circumstances where public transport is not suitable. Um, but when you're sitting in traffic, perhaps one question we need to ask ourselves is this. Could we use public transport to get here? Because when you're sitting in traffic, you are the traffic. But I do accept there's circumstances where it's not, it's not always accessible or available for everyone. Mr. Buckley. Speaker, tourism is important to our city, and for buses to be able to access hotels and to bring tourists into the, to the city, it's important that DFI is working in conjunction with those businesses. So, with that in mind, I've been informed today that DFI have put a ban on private bus companies uh, allowing their passengers to get off at the Europa Hotel, uh, making visitors cart their bags throughout the city centre. So, can the minister commit? to looking at how this regulation is impacting upon the tourists coming to our city, and bearing in mind that the Europa Hotel, as the most bombed city in Europe, not only survived, but is now thriving. Let's not let it die from DFI over-regulation. Minister. Um, I, I don't know the members DFI has banned, um, but 
There, there, there has to be appropriate parking for coaches in Belfast City Centre. That, that's without doubt. And my officials are, and others are working along with Belfast City Council to see how we best identify and regulate parking for Belfast uh, City Centre and coaches. If we just have unregulated coach parking, then the, the traffic congestion the member refers to will only get worse. So let's work our way towards a solution, and I have no doubt we will be able to reach a solution on it. I call Linda Dillon. Thank the Minister. Minister, can you confirm where there is a request for a speed limit to be reduced from 40 mile per hour to 30 mile per hour? Is there a requirement for a recommendation from PSNA for the, on that reduced speed limit? Minister, there will be consultation with the PSA in that, that, that regard, particularly in terms of, of the, their history of collisions or in that stretch of road where the request for 30 mile an hour or the reduction in the speed limit or increase in the speed limit, whichever it may be, uh, is, is being requested. Thank, thank you, Minister, for the answer. And can you outline any work that's being undertaken by your department at the moment to look at policies regarding speed management measures, particularly in built-up areas? Minister, um, I had mentioned earlier in question time that as part of the 20 mile an hour review of speed limits in around some of our schools, that the question has arose: Would it be appropriate to introduce 20 mile an hour zones in certain areas, particularly residential areas? Um, and I think that's a question we need to explore further. I am aware of the, the clamour around the reduction of 20 mile an hour speed limits in Wales. Um, that was a much more general approach than I would be proposing. I would be proposing that we look at particularly residential areas without three roads on them and to see if a reduction of 20 mile an hour would increase um, road safety for both whoever happens to be using the road. But I think it's something we do need to explore further. David Brooks. The Minister for his answers so, so far. He will know that my constituency of East Belfast was particularly impacted by the traffic chaos that we've seen at the weekend, uh, largely due, due to, I think, poor traffic management around the area. Um, could I ask the Minister to uh, undertake to talk to relevant colleagues to ensure that uh, there's a review of what happened at the weekend to ensure it doesn't happen again? Minister, I'm looking at your rural colleagues as they looking on envy upon Belfast receiving its £3.2 million roads improvement, its £340 million uh, bus and rail station. Your rural colleagues are going, what are you complaining about? But I do accept there has been traffic congestion in Belfast city centre. We are reviewing it and lessons, if lessons need to be learned from the weekend, will be learned as we are moving forward. But we are resurfacing a, a, mere, a major artery into Belfast. That is the reason we are resurfacing it, because it is such a high volume road network. And I, think I, I suspect most of the members in this chamber travel it on a daily basis. It needs upgraded, it needs resurfaced, and that is why we are doing it. But yes, if lessons can be learned, they will be. Rich. I thank the Minister for his answer. And I was just about to say my rural co colleagues will benefit more probably than the, the residents of, of Sydenham who felt that they were locked into uh, the residential streets at the weekend. Uh, so yes, just, just impressed one. There, there were events taking place in the uh, wider area that involved road closures and so on at the weekend. Uh, and I, I would just ask that perhaps that there, think those things were, would be taken into account in the future and perhaps looked at doing more, more of the work in the evenings. Thank you, Minister. Minister. Well, yes, and, and we do try to coordinate as, as much as we can, but we are scheduling a major work scheme um, both in terms of the opportunity to do it with our contractors who have been involved in a number of other major road schemes. We want to do it when the weather is reasonably good, um, so you have the timing on it sometime. And, and the work at this, I think this week's work was carried out between 10 and 6 a.m. in the morning, or 10 in the evening and 6, 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, and there will be further works in, in the weeks and months ahead, but we are. We will look, and as I say, if lessons need to be learned, they will be learned. There will be inconvenience. We cannot completely uh, plan out inconvenience. There is going to be an inconvenience as a result of this scheme and other schemes, but I hope and have no doubt uh, suspect that when the schemes are complete, people will welcome the fact that the work has been done. Ms. Cummins. the Minister for his assessment of the um, success of the part-time 20 mile per hour zones outside schools? Minister. As I said to one of, my, one of your colleagues earlier, um, I am going to allow the committee to see the full report before I make detailed comment on it, but it is welcome the fact that, I welcome the fact that the contribution from teachers, pupils and parents in, in their feedback about the report, it clearly has had benefits. Um, and we, we, 
as a result of the consultation and the work that has been done. We understand those benefits much further, but I think it's only right and proper the committee is given its place. Kimmons. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I know certainly across my area where they're in place, um, there have been benefits. Could I ask then if in any future tranche, tranches of the rollout of the 20 mile per hour uh, part time zones, would the Department consider Killian Primary School in my constituency um, as part of that? We have been lobbying for some time. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I am aware of the members lobbying in regards to that school, um, and yes, it will be taken under consideration in, in any future. Uh, launch of the scheme to include more schools across the north. I asked the Minister for the status of the Departmental Taxi Advisory Forum. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have the details in that regard in front of me. I have recently met the taxi industry. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago where I had discussions with them. Um, and in, in truth, Taxi style. It was quite frank and straight talking, which <laughs> it was okay. Uh, but we have. I, I've had discussions at ministerial level with them in recent weeks. Wrong. The minister will no doubt be aware that many within the disabled community, myself included, face challenges with being able to access accessible transport, and indeed it's been covered in the media recently, the broad range and scope of that. Can the minister advise what work his department's undertaken to increase the availability and the options of accessible transport here in Northern Ireland? Minister. Yes, I, I, I can assure the member now. Taxis is a step aside from my department. The, the, I, I have a certain responsibility in relation to licensing and regulation and other matters, but I don't uh, control the industry as closely as I would control TransLink uh, in that regard. But yes, in discussions with the taxi industry and others, I will be ensuring, uh, as far as my powers allow, to, that there is full accessibility for people with disabilities in our public transport system in particular. The, the treatment you received recently at Birmingham Airport, I believe it was, was, was totally unacceptable. Um, and fair play to you for highlighting the needs and, and bringing that once again to the forefront of discussions around the rights uh, of, of the disabled people and their right to access public transport fully. We have made huge strides forward in recent years in relation to public transport, and I intend to continue that. Um, but uh, the taxi industry is one step aside, but I will continue to engage with them and see what support we can offer them as well, because it's a challenge for their industry as well, uh, both in financially and otherwise. Cause, so I, I understand the challenges they face, and I, I'll work with them in any way I can. Question 8 has been withdrawn. I call Stephen Dunn. For his assessment of the impact of the introduction of one-year temporary exemption certificates on our MOT waiting times. Minister. Um, I referred to this in the, in the committee last week when I was in for questioning to the committee. If the significant reduction in correspondence to my office in relation to MOTs is a measure, then there has been some success in that regard. I think we will understand the full implications of it and the su success or otherwise of it uh, by spring of next year, which was our target to reduce waiting times to around six weeks by spring of next year. But thus far, the, the various indications are that we are seeing improvement across the board. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, and thank the Minister for that. And I do appreciate progress has been made. Certainly, my own local centre in Newton Orge is, is still over two months, which is appreciate still is over your, your target time. Just in relation to that, any update um, on the, the Hyde Bank MOT centre, which was due to be opened two years ago, over two years ago? Minister. Uh, yeah, um, the, the reopening of Hyde Bank is still causing us huge frustrations and challenges. Um, I hope to have further announcements or engagements around that in the coming weeks, because um, we, we do have to bring that matter to a conclusion one way or the other. On Tennyson. Minister, may I ask if you have had any engagement with ABC Council regarding the proposed changes to traffic flow at Rough Island Street and Scarva Street in Banbridge? Minister. I, I have not had direct engagement as Minister with them, but uh, my, my officials from the Section Office will have had engagement with the Council in that regard. Mr. Helson. Thank you. Minister, given the significant public concern at the potential for those changes to cause traffic chaos, could I ask that you engage and commit to engage with the Council urgently and before those changes take place? Minister. I am happy to uh, write to the Council and, and establish the, the, their views on this matter. Um, I am aware of the issue uh, as, as a local resident of the borough, um, but I, as I say, I have no direct engagement, but we will follow up with the Council. We move to questions to the Minister for Justice. Congratulations, Mr. Dowden, getting through all of your topicals.